Welcome, everybody. You can go ahead and get seated now. Welcome. We are very glad you're here this morning. There are cards in the seats in front of you. If you have a prayer request, you can drop it in in the back. There's also communion cups if you need one. Go ahead and go back there and get one. Welcome, everybody. Now, if you please, you can go me. ahead and get seated now. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day they've given us. Thank you that Welcome. we get to come here and fellowship and to learn more about we your We are very word. glad you're here this Thank morning. you for all that you've there done There are cards in the seats in front of you. If you have a prayer request, the freedom you to do drop this. it in, in the back. We don't need to worry There's about it. There's also communion cups if you need one. Persecuted. Go ahead and, and go back there and just get thank you. Welcome, everybody. Right now, if you please, you can go ahead and get seated now. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day they've given us. Thank you that Welcome. we get to come here and fellowship and to learn more about we your are very work. glad you're here this thank morning. you for all that you've there done are cards in the seats in front of you if you have a prayer request the freedom to drop this. it in in the back we don't need to worry about so communion cups if you need one just to go ahead and go back there and get me welcome everybody please go ahead and get seated now dear lord thank you for this wonderful day they've given us thank you that welcome you get to come here and fellowship and to learn more about we your are very glad you're here this morning thank you for all that you've done there are cards in the seats in front of you if you have a Feasting on the riches of his grave. Resting neath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing. Keep me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me. Far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall be with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keep me singing as I go. Sing and be happy. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trust in his promises grand. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. 
Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Ought we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky? When it seems our fortune's over, frown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust you may stay, we shall have pleasures untold. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. I found a biblical reason not to wear a mask today. First Thessalonians, oops, wrong, 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 wrong. Quick. Um, now I got lost. Have to turn page. Yeah, first Thessalonians, I did write it right. I read it and I did read it read right. Isn't that strange? Jody's been, we've been trying to work in Thessalonian verses, and that's, so I'm going to work in a Thessalonian verse. First Thessalonians 2, 5. Paul said, you know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. So we're asking for the offering. I'm not going to wear a mask. So I'm not, I don't want to cover any greed. You can see I don't have any greed in my face. Um, that's only found in um, new NIV, any other translation, it will say a pretext for greed. So their translation is a little different, but it does have mask in it. Uh, the verse I wanted to actually wanted to bring up today was Proverbs 1917. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. And he will repay him for his deed. Just a, a, a thought that when God is, oh, whoops. Anyway, just a thought that um, when you give to the poor, which is a godly thing to do, you're actually lending money to God. And God is the best creditor to have because he always pays his debts. He pays us back more than we ask. In, uh, in Matthew, Jesus said a parable, in Matthew 25, and the king will say to those on his right, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me, I was sick. I was in prison and you visited me. Um, as you did it to the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. So we got to remember that there are poor out there in the world that God had a reason for why some people are poor and some are rich. And the reason that we have plenty is so we can give to the poor. Let's give thanks for that ability. Let's remember that, just ponder the thought that besides us being in God's debt, maybe God's in our debt in some way. Dear Father, we thank you for all the gracious gifts that you give us. We thank you for the, the debt that you paid for us. We thank you, Father, for all that we have and the fact that 
we're not hungry or naked, but that we have plenty to share. As we can giving this offering at church, we know that a little bit goes for the things here, but just as the just as the early church gave and gave to share with others, they gave so much that the, the apostles had had to find help at, at distributing the things that were given. Make it so here with at this church. May we give so much that it becomes a problem. That, that we have to have more workers that finding ways to distribute, to share. Father, thank you for these blessings that all come because of your love for us and your gift of your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nailed to the cross. <clears throat> there was one who was willing to die in my stead that a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross he was willing to tread. There died no life to forgive. They are nailed to the cross, they are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and wrong, Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sin with him there. He is tender and loving and patient with me while he cleanses my heart of its rot. But there's no condemnation, I know I am free, for my sins are all nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross, they are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sins with him there. I will cling to my Savior and never depart. I will joyfully journey each day. With a song on my lip and a song in my heart that my Savior have been taken away. They are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross. But he carried my sin with him there. On bended knee. On bended knee I come. With a humble heart I come. Bowing down before your holy throne. 
lifting holy hands to you as I pledge my love anew. I worship you in spirit. I worship you in truth. Make my life a holy shine unto you. On bended knee I come, with a broken heart I come, bowing down before your holy throne. As I look upon your face, show your mercy and your grace. Change my life, O Holy Spirit. Make me fresh and ever Make my life a holy sacrifice to you. Will you join me in reading our passage, please? Down in Luke chapter 20. Verses 9 through 18. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they also said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And he threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard, vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, that is the Pharisees and the scribes, when they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Well, greetings, church family. I hope you're enjoying the beautiful weather we're having. It's uh, pretty good. Now, I want to take a moment and uh, recognize the significance of this weekend, Memorial Day weekend. It's a special holiday. If you've been following Facebook, you've seen quite a few posts that are distinguishing between the three big veteran-themed holidays. So May 15th was Armed Forces Day, probably right by you, right? It honors service members who are still in uniform. So did you miss it? Well, I, I forgot to mention it last time also. Uh, they're important, but that's what that one was about. November 11th, November 11th is Veterans Day. Okay, that honors people like me. You know, with Rodney and uh, all the other veterans folks here who have served. Uh, that's what Veterans Day is for people who have served, but they're no longer in uniform. But this is Memorial Day weekend. So it's okay to thank the living for their service. You can say that if you want. But Memorial Day is about those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. So this is a solemn weekend, a solemn day, Monday, and should never be forgotten. 
uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's the most significant of the three veteran themed holidays. So please take time this weekend you know, while you're grilling and, and enjoying life. Take time to think about the freedoms that we still have. We still have some. I, I know things are, appear as if they're eroding and maybe they are, but we still have some. So thank a vet or a soldier, but please honor those who have died on the field of battle because that's the primary reason why we even have a country. And they're the reason why you enjoy freedom at all. Well, I don't have a specific message for Memorial Day. I guess that was it. Uh, other than whatever you just said, right? So it's because of the urgency that I feel to wrap up these final chapters of Luke and turn to the next volume, which is the church's genesis and formation and the mission outlined in the book of Acts. So we're going to be deep into that in a few weeks. Uh, so in the, com the coming weeks, I'll bring a few more lessons on Luke and then transition to Acts. Well, let's talk about sharecropping. The history of sharecropping in America isn't very flattering. The idea is that a, a landowner might want to farm some property that he owns, right? But rather than do the work himself, he might rent it out, uh, so to speak right, to somebody else so they can work it for him. So this person would most likely be very poor, unable to attain his own land. And so he enters into an agreement with the landowner and the owner might provide seed or tools, whatever he needs, equipment. But the sharecropper or the tenant farmer works the farm as if it was his own. And when harvest time comes, the owner receives, you know, the owner, not, not the sharecropper, but the owner receives the biggest portion of either crops or the profit from selling the crops. The sharecropper gets a much smaller portion. One of the problems that are inherent in this uh, arrangement is a sharecropper has a very difficult time accumulating wealth. So in many cases, maybe most cases, uh, he might break even, but most likely he's gonna be even further in debt year after year, so the debt gets rolled over. He just makes enough to survive on, but still hasn't made enough to pay for the land that he's using. It becomes a vicious cycle. After 1865, many former slaves at the end of the Civil War had very few options for making a living. So they were set free, but there wasn't any kind of system in place for them to make a living outside of slavery. So in many cases, they were forced to become sharecroppers just to survive. They merely changed status from slave to tenant farmer while working the same land in many cases and living under the same conditions they had when they were slaves. The main difference is though they were technically free, they no longer had the protection or whatever security they had when they were slaves. Even though they were now working for, in many cases, the very same people who were once their masters. Well, you can see right away that a system like that is pretty ripe for abuse. You know, it's not really a good way to make a living. Many sharecroppers were trapped in an endless cycle of giving all but the scraps to a man who didn't work a lick for it. Some of my ancestors were sharecroppers on both my mom and dad's side of the family. You could make a living, but it was extremely difficult to get ahead and especially to get out of it once you're in. Well, we have a situation in Luke chapter 20 that has some similarities, but it has some very significant differences as well. In Luke, it's the tenants, not the owner, who comes out looking bad. In fact, the tenants seem to be pretty wrong on many levels. It was fairly common in Palestine for a wealthy landowner to rent out, so to speak, part of his land for others to work with the same basic arrangement of, you know, tenants providing a portion of the produce to the owner. But in the case of the parable that Jesus told about a landowner and some tenants, a very unusual situation has developed. Well, the parable, this is, this is probably the only one that the most scholars say, this is allegory. It's allegorical. What does that mean? Well, it means that the elements inside the story represent something, right? Uh, 
it's not really an allegory, but it's very allegorical. The owner is God, obviously. The tenants are the Jews, uh, especially the Jewish leaders. The servants that he sends, uh, they represent the prophets. And the son of the owner, of course, Jesus. And the others that he mentions in verse 16, he will be given the vineyard as they're the Gentiles. The destruction of the tenants mentioned in verse 16 clearly refers to the destruction of the temple later on in 70 AD. And the builders in verse 17 are the religious leaders or anyone, anyone who rejects Jesus. The stone is, of course, Jesus. And the crushing he talks about in verse 18, that's not necessarily limited to AD 70. It includes anyone who rejects Jesus as the Son of God. Messiah. So this parable reflects the final days of Jesus. That's where we are. He's now entered into Jerusalem, but the scope is so much bigger than that. The parable describes the, the conduct of the people of God, that is the Jews, who were entrusted with the mission of God. This was given to them that we learned in class this morning on Mount Sinai, the mission. They consistently rejected God throughout their history, then called upon him, then rejected him, called upon him. It seemed like an endless cycle of apostasy, restoration, apostasy, restoration, on and on and on. And if you look at the, the book of Judges, you see that really played out. So throughout their history, they frequently resisted, mistreated, even killed messengers from God, the prophets. These messengers were just seeking to bring them back to faithfulness, reconnect them to God. Ultimately, God sent his son to seek and save the lost of Israel. And ultimately, they killed him, seeking to maintain control of the law. Well, in chapter 19, we discovered that once Jesus was inside Jerusalem, the religious leaders were actively seeking a way to destroy Jesus. But they weren't able to because the people, the people were hanging on, on every word of Jesus. He was popular with the crowds. Then verse 41 and following, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. This highlights the theme of the pending rejection of Jesus by the Jews, especially those leaders. In spite of the clear warnings of the prophets in scripture, they did not recognize they had been visited by God. Jesus then cleansed the temple and was daily teaching in the temple. At this point, Luke tells us that the chief priests, scribes, and principal men, that is the, the most prominent among them, they were seeking to destroy him. But they didn't find anything they could do because all the people were hanging on his words. So now that in chapter 20, where we are, on one of those days when he was teaching, that is, while he was literally gospeling the gospel, that's what the words are. The religious leaders, they wanted to trip him up by challenging his authority. So the question they put to him was, by what authority do you do these things? And he does not directly answer them. Instead, he answered their question with a question regarding John's baptism. Was it from God or from man? So now these leaders were trapped in a catch-22. Any answer they might give would have resulted in either embarrassing themselves or putting themselves in danger with the crowd. So option A, they could say John's baptism was from God. And the result would be that they would look like idiots, imbeciles, or worse. Or option B, they could say John's baptism was from man. Well, then they would get stoned for defaming a prophet. Well, there was a third choice, which they quickly embraced. Option C, refuse to answer. Well, fair is fair. If they don't have the courage to address this very important question, then that gets Jesus off the hook. He doesn't have to answer theirs. So the implied obvious answer would be that Jesus himself, as God in the flesh, has intrinsic authority. In the end, they all, all of them, even Jesus, gave the same answer. No answer at all. 
As these events unfold, it becomes clear that though everyone was listening to Jesus, they were hearing very different things. The people are hanging on every word, but the religious leaders are looking for loopholes. Official Judaism was in direct conflict with the teachings and person of Jesus. So he outfoxed the fox on the authority question. And that essentially diminished their authority. So it's at this point. This is when Jesus chooses to tell the parable. But who's he telling it to? Well, it's clearly directed at the religious leaders. And they clearly get it. But Jesus was teaching the people. He spoke the parable to them. But it was intended that the leaders would overhear it. This is a very bold and provocative thing to do. It was almost as if he was taunting them. It must have been embarrassing to stand in the presence of the people and have a very unflattering story told about you. So the vine vineyard, like we said, it's a symbol for Israel's privileged status as God's people. God expects a return on investment. Regardless of who does the work, the object is to increase the output. This is like a business if you think about it. It's a simple formula of input, process, output. God created the operating environment. He determined the product and he decided the policies and operating procedures and he staffed and filled positions, right? He then entrusted others to engage in the process and produce. And he had a definite income in mind. God expected his people to be fruitful. They were to offer a portion of the prophets, you know, their blessings as a thanksgiving. And what was Israel supposed to produce? Well, they were to be a light to the nations. They were to represent and glorify God, to put him on display, as we've been saying for weeks now, like on, our, on the videos we've been watching for class. They were to love God with all their hearts, right? All their soul, all their being, all their strength, all their might. And they were to love their neighbors as themselves. They were to embrace the visitation of God. Their reward for faithfulness includes blessings beyond imagination. But those blessings were designed to be used to fulfill their mission. Their mission of glorifying and witnessing for God. Remember that input, process, output? They failed. Official Israel corrupted the original divine intent. They made it about themselves and their own ability to control the process. They did not produce what God intended. They did not return to God what God required. They rejected God's purpose for themselves. They rejected the prophets. Ultimately, they rejected the son who was and is the true owner and heir of all things. The evil tenants, however, uh, they took him outside the vineyard. The crucifixion of Jesus took place outside of Jerusalem. They killed him, as had been foretold. So what's the owner supposed to do? How is he supposed to respond to a stubborn, stiff-necked, self-serving people? It's not like the owner didn't care about the vineyard or the tenants or that he was negligent in any way. This is not a story illustrated, you know, like deism. Remember you hear about deism? Uh, like some of the founders, like Thomas Jefferson and others, believed in, in deism. It's, they saw a God who was like a clockmaker. Right? Just took it and wound it up and put it up on the mantle and just walked off and left it. Uh, so he's basically disinterested in us. He only checks back every now and then. But we're really not that important to him. We're really on our own. No, no. This is a God, our God, who is directly involved in the affairs of people and deeply and directly involved in the, affa the affairs of his, of his people. In the parable, a man who owned some land planted a vineyard. Now, it would take a few years. Uh, it's not, it's not going to produce right away. It would take 
maybe three years before it began to produce grapes. Uh, once it began producing consistently, it'd still be another few years before it was at maximum capacity. So you're talking about some time, right? Uh, so it makes perfect sense that when he left uh, this vineyard in the hands of these tenants, he would be gone for an extended period of time. So back in the parable we looked at of the 10 minas, the emphasis there was on distance, right? The ruler traveled to a far country to receive a kingship. Here the emphasis is on time for an extended period of time until the vineyard was ripe and ready for harvest. The owner left the process to the tenants. So what's unusual is how the tenants responded when the owner sent servants to collect the rent. Rent that was owed to him. The first servant was rejected. The tenants beat him and sent him away. The beating symbolizes the rejection of the prophets and the hostility of Israel's leaders toward God. Seems a little extreme, but it was common practice that if an owner should fail to return to collect rent, if enough time went by, the tenants had grounds, legal grounds to claim the vineyard for themselves. So the arrival of a servant might be a threat. Once you're committed to a certain course of action, sometimes hard to change. Each subsequent servant showing up uh, to collect the rent would give them even more reason to double down on abusing them and sending them away until the owner himself shows up. They'd be emboldened to continue to mistreat the servants, even increasing their abuse with each visit. So the visitation of the servants, these writ collectors, probably occurred in yearly intervals. Since the vineyard is new, it would, wouldn't have produced much for several years. The first servant may have come along at the first expected year of anything of significance, right? Any kind of a produce. The next year would be a little better and so forth. So more is at stake each passing year. With a better crop each following year, more would be at stake. So Luke plays on the contrast of sending, the word sending. In verse 10, the owner sends a servant to the tenants, using the same word for apostle, which just means the sent one. They send him back using a form of the same word, meaning they sent him out or sent him back. Verse 11 uses a different word for send, but this one just means uh, in addition to the first time he was sent. Well, there's an escalation in how the tenants respond. Uh, so they treat him, this guy shamefully. They beat the first guy. This guy, they beat him and treat him shamefully. Uh, that's a word that means they essentially violated his civil rights. They deprived him of honor and respect. They sent him back too. In both cases, Jesus makes a point that they came back empty-handed. Historically, the more effort God put into reaching his people, the more resistant and reactionary they became. Ultimately, it led to captivity. In verse 12, the owner again sends a third servant using the same word as in verse 11. This time, the tenants don't merely send him back. They wound him, more serious than just beating him, treating him shamefully. He's wounded. And this time, He's cast out, a much harsher word than before. They merely dishonored the second servant. This one was physically injured. In verses 13 to 16, the owner sends his son. It's a final effort to get the tenants to do the right thing. Now, you and I, might have, we might have brought a lawsuit, right, after the first guy, or surely after the second guy. So the patience of this owner is astonishing. He wants to reverse the treatment of the second servant. Surely the son would be respected and honored. The word for send in this case is much more emphatic and it underscores the mission aspect. This is not a servant. This is an equal to the owner himself. They not only threw him out, which is the same word used for the third servant, but they had spent time deliberating about it, plotting it, 
It was their plan before he even got there. Just as the current religious leaders, just as they were doing with Jesus, they cast him out and then killed him. Jesus was dragged outside of Jerusalem and crucified. The tenants mistakenly thought that eliminating the son would improve their chances of securing ownership of the vineyard. How does that work? Well, maybe so much time has gone by, they assume the owner may have died or just got too old to manage his affairs. And he did something similar to chapter 15 in Luke. Remember the, the prodigal son? Uh, maybe the father turned his inheritance over early. But for whatever reason, they thought this was the key. I've always been fascinating on some level at the degree to which people can be so self-deluded or blinded by their own preconceptions. So blinded that they're able to justify committing absolute horror while believing they're doing the right thing. Evil in its most hideous form becomes acceptable, even desirable to the point of rebranding it as good. It's easy to cast things in extreme terms. Uh, the more extreme, the more obvious, but often it's more subtle. Sometimes people, good people, decide that someone's bad or defective or dangerous. Right? Words get thrown around like unclean, unsafe, false teacher, ignoramus, incompetent, on and on and on. If you can manage to label somebody in some derogatory way, you can dehumanize them. Then you can ignore their feelings. It just becomes irrelevant. Nothing good about them is allowed to slip through the filter. It becomes very easy to assign all sorts of bad things about people. Everything they do or say is suspect at best. Kind of like our political system. The religious leaders are so committed to their opposition to Jesus, they can't even appreciate that they are the tenants in this parable. They see that Jesus is accusing them of being these tenants, but they just can't see that. They are insulted that Jesus would imply that they are living, breathing examples of Israel's dark history. The history of rejecting and killing the prophets who were trying, just trying to reconcile them back to God. No, to them, Jesus was the problem. Like the tenants, they schemed and plotted and ultimately killed him. Well, in response to this objection they make, Jesus quotes Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Just as they are the tenants in the parable, they are also the builders. Verse 17. Jesus continues to allude, Isaiah chapter 8, when he says, everyone who falls on that stone will, will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. They had rejected God by rejecting Jesus. They had determined that he was unworthy and unfit. Because of their rejecting him, God rejected them. Now, as always, it's important to try and see yourself in the story, even if it makes you uncomfortable. No one wants to volunteer to play the part of the Pharisee or the Sadducee or scribe or chief priest. No one wants to be identified with the Romans either. We don't want to imagine standing in the crowd, crying out, crucify him, crucify him. At the same time, it's very important or very difficult to escape that. After all, your sins and mine, our sins, our collective sins, they all have a collective responsibility for putting Jesus on the cross to begin with. Just think about it. God put Adam and Eve in the garden to tend it, to care for it, as if it was Adam's garden. And look how famously he failed. We've been failing ever since. Yet God has visited us. He has made it very clear what he expects from us. So how are you doing with that? If God has entrusted you with salvation, then he has also entrusted you with service. There's no escape. 
He has begun a good work in you. Remember that's what it says in Philippians 1. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will, be, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So a question comes to mind. If God has taken away the vineyard, that is the kingdom, from them and given it to us, what has changed about what God expects? What has changed? Are we now the tenants? Aren't we? Does God still expect, require that we bear fruit? Isn't the input the same? Isn't the process the same? So what has changed about the output, what we produce? If Israel was to be a light to the nations, then what are we to be to the world around us? Like the parable last week, where we learned that we're supposed to be fully engaged in conducting kingdom business, surely we can see that it also applies to being fruitful. How are we treating the message? How are we treating the messenger? How are we treating the real Jesus? God has given us a mission. We learned in class that the Great Commission was first given to Israel. Now it's ours. There are so many ways to be fruitful, but ultimately it means becoming disciples who make disciples. The two polar extremes are this. We can follow Jesus, which is the path of discipleship, or we can reject him. We can say no. We can tell ourselves that we're just fine believing and practicing the familiar. I was just fine you know, doing all right before you came along and started challenging me. Maybe you're thinking. Well, here's another one of those news flashes. You can make that choice, but you don't have that option. It looks a little like this. Option A, you can be of God. Result, <laughs> salvation, inclusion in the kingdom. Option B, you can be of man. Continue. Continue on doing it your way. Option C, do nothing. Reject the Son of God and his clear call for all of us to follow him. Options B and C have the same result or outcome. Destruction. Crushed by the cornerstone. It's pretty bleak. Jesus is calling. What, how will you answer? You know, we're only renting space down here. Are you going to pay the rent? Will you bow with me at this time? Lord, we're so thankful that Jesus did what he did. He endured what he endured. And Father, it's so powerful that it was in spite of all, all the efforts that were tremendous efforts to stop him. And it could not stop him. Father, help us to see that we are your people. We are the tenants in your vineyard. We are the ones in the process. Help the output, Father. Help the product be exactly what you prescribe, what you're looking for. Help us to be faithful to you, to follow Jesus, to engage in kingdom business. And Father, through us, produce a great crop. Bless this church. Bless each of us. Help us to see our role and have the commitment to work in your kingdom. All in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Will everybody please stand for the next two songs? One day. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Lived 
have your Bibles with you, please open. We're going to be looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's a verse, verses I'm sure that we've all looked at. We talk about today being Memorial Day, and it is. It's right there on the calendar. It's, it's a federal holiday. The banks are all going to be shut down. But do we remember that every Sunday is a Memorial Day? Every Sunday is when we remember what Christ did for us. And, and we do this in part by participating in the Lord's Supper. Starting in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together as we prepare for this memorial. Our Father in heaven, we stand before you. Father, we thank you that we have this reminder, this way to celebrate this memorial. And Father, we, we have a tendency to get stuck in tradition, in routine and in habit. Father, help it be that something we do regularly retains the meaning that you had for it, that we would do this in remembrance of you, of your body given for us. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your son who died for us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
We continue on in verse 11 or chapter 11, verse 25. It says, in the same way, he, Jesus, also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There's an imperative there. Do this in remembrance of me. But then the next verse tells us the why. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're proclaiming. Memorial Day is about proclaiming too, right? We proclaim our appreciation for those who have died, those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for our country. How much more are we to be proclaiming the Lord's death because of the freedom, the overcoming, the hope beyond what we can even measure or imagine that we have in Christ? Would you pray with me? Father, we continue in this memorial, in this feast. Father, help us to live our lives in remembrance of you, that our actions would be reminders to us and to others, that our sharing this cup would honor you and remind us of what we live for. Father, we look forward to standing in your presence and hearing you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, be with us as we prepare for this. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Jesus coming soon. <clears throat> Trouble sometimes are here, filling man's heart with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now's a stake. Come in your heart to God, safe from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christian awake. Jesus coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the sky. Going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Love of so many cold, losing their home of gold. This in God's word is told, evils abound. When the signs come to pass, nearing the end at last, it will come very fast. Trumpets will sound. Jesus coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. All the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the sky, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore, free from all care. 
rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye. Homeward we then will fly, glory to share. Jesus coming soon, or night or noon, many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the sky, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. I appreciate everybody being here. There's a, there's a lot to be said for family coming together and remembering and praising the Father. So thank you. We, uh, we have a busy week ahead. Starts tonight at 5. We get together for prayer. It's all virtual. If you have a computer and you can shop on Amazon, you can pray with us. If, you don't, if you're not sure how, uh, ask. ask. We'll, we'll get you set up and get you there. Um, Look through the bulletin. There's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of prayers, uh, and I appreciate very much that there's a lot of praises. We, we see our prayers being answered, family, if we're honest and if we're looking for them. Um, also, let's, let's uh, keep up with what's going on. Uh, today, after services, we have the next installment of the journaling class. We're, gonna, we're working our way through 1 Thessalonians. We'll get eventually through 2 Thessalonians. Um, we're in chapter 2 today. If you haven't done it, and you're interested, don't let the fact that you haven't done it start stop you from doing it the first time. Come join us. We'll, we'll, we'll be done with you. I mean, they put up with me, um, so there's hope for everyone else. Um, next Sunday, June 6th, we're going to have our first potluck in a long time, but we're going to be celebrating our graduates. So, so plan to stay, plan to uh, help us send these uh, young people on to the next phase of their lives. Uh, I'm sure it's exciting. I'm sure it's scary. Uh, I'm sure some, some of the parents are, are ready too. Um, I'm sure some of the kids are too. So look through, look through the bulletin. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of, a lot of different ways to get involved and get engaged. Um, make sure you're looking at the prayer requests as well. There's a lot going on, just like in any family, there's a lot going on. Let's be in each other's lives. Let's make this uh, let, let's make this a, a full contact sport as we're as we're worshiping and living together. We're going to close in prayer. We're going to do our congregational scripture, and then we're going to have time for fellowship. If there's somebody you haven't talked to in a while, somebody that you haven't met, somebody that you haven't seen, go talk to them. Find out how they're doing. Start with a sports question if you want to, but find out how they're doing. It might take two or three times of asking, but be persistent. It's worth it. Let's pray together, family. Lord God, we're humbled before you. Father, open our eyes that we will see you, that we will truly understand what it means to live for you, that we will be good stewards. Father, help us to be gospeling the gospel, that we can share your word in our actions, that we will show your love by what we do and, and how we relate to others. Lord, you've, you've blessed us with opportunities galore. Help us to be mindful and living for the kingdom. Father, I ask you to be with those that are on our prayer list, for all those that are struggling and hurting. Father, we praise your name for the answers to prayers, for the recovery, for the the healings. Father, we know that you work with power and might. Help us not be so short-sighted and so blind that we miss it. And Father, with the coming week, we know that you will open, open doors and, and give us opportunities. Lord, open our eyes that we can see. Father, I'm so thankful for this body, for this family that you've blessed us with. Give us hearts to see you. Father, we thank you for your son, for his love for us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Okay. If you'll repeat after me, Jude chapter 1, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. 
expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Amen. All right, family, let's spend some time fellowshipping.